So when I was uh, at my high school graduation, I recall that our performance choir sang a song that I had heard around my house a lot because my mom was a Tony Bennett fan. And so I, I had heard songs like I Left My Heart in San Francisco all the time and The Shadow of Your Smile. And the one that was at my graduation, which was If I Ruled the World. Do some of you know that song? It was, a very, it was kind of a standard by the time I was uh, graduating. But I remember the wor words because we learned them. And I, I was trying to remember them the other day. And it was, if I ruled the world, every day would be the first day of spring. Every heart would have a new song to sing. And we'd sing of the joy every morning would bring. And then I couldn't remember the, the rest, so you do what any 21st century modern woman does. You Google it. If I ruled the world, every man would be as free as a bird. Every voice would be a voice to be heard. Take my word, we would treasure each day that occurred. And then finally it said, every head would be held up high. There'd be sunshine in everyone's sky if the day ever dawned when I ruled the world. And we sang that with so much passion because, hey, it was 1970 and we knew how to make the world different. We would get it right if we were in charge. It was youthful optimism and youthful arrogance. It popped into my head when I thought this week about King David and, and King Solomon, where we pick up our stories today. If you recall, last week we had poor King Saul and Saul um, ended up in a kind of disgrace. He fell on his own sword. He basically committed suicide because he was facing defeat. And he had fallen into such jealousy and such uh, self-interest that uh, he couldn't be an effective ruler any longer. He really couldn't. And he certainly had ceased to be an instrument of God and what God had envisioned for the people of this small nation. His death opens up the door then for David who's already captured the hearts and the loyalty of a, a significant number of the people. And God, remember, had already ordained him. Samuel had anointed him to be the next king when he was still just a young boy. Now, uh, the time comes then for him to be king, and it is not a simple transition. And we're in 2 Samuel now in 1 Kings, if you want to read further and more closely, because there's lots of details that go with these stories. But remember, we're kind of skipping through the Hebrew Bible. The kingdom is very divided about who should be king. There are those who immediately uh, uh, call David to be king. That's the, the Judah, the tribes of Judah. And he, at, while he is serving as their king, works diligently then to become united with those who are uh, in the kingdom, the parts of the kingdom that still appreciate that it is Saul and Saul's family who should be in charge. So he reigns as the, as the king of Judah for about seven years, the whole time working on this. And there are stories of battles and intrigues uh, constantly during this time. But he presents himself to everyone sincerely as a man of goodwill and of great faith. And people grow more and more to love and respect him. And at the end of those seven years, after much difficulty, the kingdoms are united under David as one. And then he does what is really a very smart thing. He does not place the capital in the north or in the south where the divides have been. He conquers Jerusalem, which is somewhat in the middle. So the capital is at a place that has not been, been uh, the, the mainstay of either part of the kingdom. So this is why Jerusalem is known as the city of David. And this is why he moves the Ark of the Covenant there. And this is why in Solomon's time, the temple will be built there. There's never going to be another king like David. He united the people and he brought government and religion into balance. He kept people safe from their enemies that surrounded him on all sides in this little nation. And he was loved and he was trusted, not just by the people, but by God as well. If you uh, know the stories of David, then you know that they indicate that God can bring change and express power through less than perfect people. And probably the, the uh, most famous story of, of David and his less than perfect way of being in the world was the story of David and Bathsheba. And if you remember, uh, Uriah and Bathsheba were husband and wife and he was off in battle fighting to protect 
uh, the people, and uh, Bathsheba just happens to be bathing on her rooftop one day. Don't ask me why. And, and uh, David uh, catches, you know, sees this and, and is immediately enamored, and they have an affair that results in a pregnancy. And this, the only thing that David can think of is to have Uriah sent back from the field as a messenger, and then he'll reward him by sending him home, where if they can just spend some time together, it will seem to be that this baby is Uriah's, not David's. But Uriah is such a good soldier. He refuses to go home. He needs to be treated like every soldier who is still in battle. And so David sends him then back to battle with instructions to... Um, Uriah's superiors, that he's to be placed where there's no question but that he will be killed in battle. And that is what happens. And so we find that David and Bathsheba marry, and this child is born, and this child dies. And Scripture says this child dies in a very real sense as a penalty for David and Bathsheba's indiscretion. And David accepts this. Now, the prophet in David's time... And if you're like me, you get the prophets all mixed up. So the prophet to remember in association with David is Nathan. And Nathan uh, comes to him with word from God that you have, in fact, really, really blown it with Bathsheba. And so all that unfolds after that leaves David very, very contrite, very, very aware of his sin, of his infidelity. And, and we know that he prays and comes close to God seeking forgiveness wanting to put things right. And this is a process that David has again and again when he is afraid, when he's blown it, when he's struggling, he turns to God. Now, Psalm 51 uh, in the book of Psalms is a psalm that is often attributed to David. At the very least, it is about David. Most specifically, about the time when uh, David is repentant and is seeking the forgiveness of God for his relationship with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly through my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my... Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your spirit from me. Deliver me from death, O God, O God of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of salvation. And so that's Psalm 51, David's desire. It is his desire for a clean heart and a right spirit with God that keeps him in tune with God's vision for the people even in the midst of his sin and his foibles. It is that desire to be right with God that gives him a successful reign of 40 years, even when his sons strategize to take his throne. When he does pass the throne along, it is to Solomon. He gives him extensive instructions about what it means to serve as king under God's guidance. And after some complications with David's other sons, Solomon is ready to be king, and he takes all of this very seriously, and he makes a burnt offering to God of 1,000 burnt offerings while worshiping and trying to show his faith and vigilance. God comes to uh, Solomon in a dream because God is very pleased, and God says to him that, Solomon, you may have whatever it is you wish in this life. And Solomon's wish is simply this, I wish to govern your people well and distinguish between right and wrong. Now this was a very good wish, and God is so pleased with this wish that God then gives Solomon not only the wisdom he has sought, but also honor and riches as well. And Solomon's rule over uh, Israel is some of the most peaceful years of the kingdom. And uh, he builds the temple in Jerusalem, and he offers wisdom to people who come from far and wide because he truly is so very wise. And he develops more and more riches and a strong reputation, and it's really good for almost 40 years. But by the end of his rule, he has acquired 
700 wives and 300 concubines. And they come from tribes all around uh, the nation and beyond. And, uh, and so these, these wives and concubines uh, become part of a sort of self-indulgent, crazy life in which his own faith and his relationship to God gets so watered down that when he is no longer king, the nation then again divides. And that's where we will take things next week. So there's a pair of kings today, David and Solomon, a pair of kings who were basically, seriously, very good kings. A pair of kings who for the most part and for a long time did what God would have them do. A pair who kept the kingdom united and gave the people a taste of what it could be like to live the way God would have them live. But it does not last. It could not last. And it is not so very different today. We live in a nation where we can shape our government with our voices and our votes and our actions. And this does matter tremendously. We should never squander this power we have to bring justice and to bring peace in our world. But government by itself cannot bring the kingdom of God. Government by itself cannot bring the kingdom of God. It couldn't do it in David's day and Solomon's day. It can't do it today. But that longing for leaders to rise that will save us from ourselves, that will bring us close to God, we start to see why the people were looking for the Messiah, the one who would come and would bring uh, everyone close to God. It would be someone like David and what he had done in the past, someone from David's line who would be right with God and close to God and loved by the people. We see why Jesus it's good satisfies to notice that this the role altar of Messiah where for sacrifices many in his and rituals time. were performed. And now we're going to explore, explore that more next week. This, where everyone this, comes uh, together direction, and this trajectory a meal. we find ourselves it on is this ritual from the line of, of David. Bread and sharing the cup. But interestingly Inviting enough, to what I want to talk to you about now the is life poker. Of Jesus, his death, his because we have this pair of kings. These are food. And I don't God. play poker often, but what I do know is this that a full meal, house beats a pair of kings. Are doing all over the world a full this very day, house beats a pair of not kings. Only to look back, the gathering of peoples to, who to are prepared are, to, to give the their lives to, dream, to the work of Jesus for dream, the kingdom of God beats a pair of kings the any of God day. Among us and if I can paraphrase Steve Jobs from our Now Testament earlier, so we this, are a full house that is learning Jesus how to put a dent the in betrayed, the universe. We are a people this, said, learning to, and discovering what it is we love, where we are passionate him, and pursuing that. We are learning says, to master the message of love so that we are offering Broken dreams and you. visions, not just hey, beliefs. We are a full house of people who are connecting with the world night, rather than just paying meal, attention to exactly what is in Jesus front of again, us. And at the same time, we are people who are saying struggle, no to 10,000 things that don't matter so that we can focus on so what this wine does matter. Is my blood, and that means and that we can experience these insanely different understandings and, of Jesus and we can experience me. the message and the love of God so, in ways that people morning, can be surprised by. Has come and gone. We can share that gladly. Gone home from church. Now a to full house is us, not the highest people are hand still rising, in poker, still headed but the off church, the church is not intended to be years, the highest hand. Terrible. Church this is intended to be the opening the of ourselves in our imaginations and in the lives we so live we where God and rules and the world, where the love and the future rules with this the world. Of grace. And that could make the world prayer. a place where every day would be the first Gracious day God, of spring. Thank you. Every heart for could have a new song to sing. Body every head could be held this up high. There would be sunshine in everyone's sky. If the day if ever comes when love offer ourselves rules the world. world. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen.